Good morning. And aloha from the most southwestern state in the Southwestern Surgical Conference. Um, I've, I've been asked by Dr. Hughes today to talk on the topic of what can rural surgery learn from the United States Army? I have no financial disclosures. I'm, I'm in the Army. Uh, however, I must note that my opinions present the, today are just that, they're mine. They're not representative of any department of the government. My talk today will follow this outline. First, I will discuss Army surgery as a system for surgical care. Next, I will discuss how we recruit surgeons and then how we train them once they're in our system. I will then discuss how we assign surgeons to the various duty locations around the globe. Lastly, I will discuss how we support and sustain the rural surgeon or remote surgeon in their respective duty locations. For most of the talk, I will use my own region, the Pacific Regional Medical Command, as the example. It is my hope that by showing the audience how we have dealt with rural surgery, that the civilian community may develop some ideas to augment its own. Habit number two from Dr. Stephen Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is to begin with the end in mind. As the Advisory Council on Rural Surgery proceeds with its recommendations for the development of a rural surgery track, I would humbly advise them that the chief factor that allows Army surgery to successfully meet its obligations with regard to rural surgery is that Army surgery is a true system. In fact, it is a worldwide system that interacts with the systems of other uniformed services to compromise the global military health system. Both inside and outside of the United States, our system also interacts with civilian facilities and providers to contract services where and when the direct provision of care is impossible. It is imperative to commanders at all level that every beneficiary in their charge be covered for medical and surgical care, and multiple uh, systems exist to hold them accountable to that charge. Towards that end, the commanders must staff, train, and resource their providers to care for the patients. Globally, two interwoven systems of regionalization exist to meet the needs of the patients and of the surgeons. These are for the stateside and overseas fixed facilities and the field deployable medical assets. So what does that look like? Our global system breaks down into essentially six regions, and these regions are broken down into levels of care that uncover the entire region. The left column is how we generally arrange deployed levels of care. There are five levels that begin with an aid station and end with a stateside medical center. Um, <clears throat> there are specific circumstances where there is patient flow variance in the scheme, like taking a wounded soldier from the point of injury directly to a forward surgical team or to a combat support hospital. But this is the usual scheme of flow. The right column is how we arrange care for the U.S. or for fixed facilities. Again, there are specific circumstances where community hospitals are bypassed. But as you can see, and there is a little overlap again at the medical center level. Um, this bold text now highlights the facilities at which a surgeon is usually stationed. My personal experience stems from all of these levels with the exception of a facility like Landstuhl in Germany. <clears throat> However, it is at these highlighted levels of care where our surgical practices are most like the rural practices of our civilian counterparts. So we'll attend to level two as a forward surgical team. Fully staffed forward surgical teams contain about 20 people. That's it. Four surgeons, the two to three general surgeons or one to two orthopods, depending on the mix. Three nurses, three nurse anesthetists, two admin personnel, three LPNs, three OR techs, and three medics. They're designed to operate with support for up to 72 hours with over 30, 30 critical patients during that 72 hours. Of the 72 hours, there's a total of 24 hours of operative table time planned across two tables. The FST can be, and now, in current operations, is most commonly split into half FSTs, even smaller units. They have 20 to 40 units of blood products available. A combat support hospital, or CASH, is a very modular facility that can be configured for the assigned mission and can have from 16 to 256 beds, but most commonly of 84 beds. They have two to eight OR tables and can be split from two to five locations. Pharmacy, lab, x-ray, and the possibility of a CT scanner exists, and dental assets may augment the surgical package. 
The surgical element consists of four surgeons, two general surgeons, an orthopedist, and a gynecologist, two emergency medicine physicians, one critical care physician, and one ward physician. And a combat support hospital may have two of those surgical packages. Depending on mission configuration, specialty augmentation can consist of any of the following. Plastics, audiology, dermatology, podiatry, neurology, pain management, OT, um, and even potentially what we call a neurosurgical team or K team. It may have over 80 units of blood on hand at their different sites. For fixed facilities, a small community hospital can have one to two general surgeons, one orthopedist, one to two gynecologists. They may have only one to three OR or procedure suites and generally do not have an ICU. Their blood supply is usually quite limited and may have to contract and pool with the local community to try to get blood when and where needed. So a fully staffed and deployed combat support hospital can actually have significantly more capability than a small fixed community hospital in the United States. This is the map of the United States Pacific Command. It shows, as indicated by the black arrowheads, most of the sites that we support is a system of clinics, community hospitals, and a medical center. The multi-service nature of the area that Tripler serves is illustrated by our support of an Army, an Air Force, and two Navy hospitals, as well as a multitude of clinics of all branches. Our area of operation covers over 105 million square miles, crosses 15 time zones, and has 3,000 languages spoken in it. Robust systems for communication and transportation of patients ensure that both patients and surgeons get the support that they need in order to provide excellent and timely care to our military beneficiaries, their families, and other covered beneficiaries. These are photos of a small deployed half FST type of a team that I was recently in charge of in Central America. I was also the only surgeon assigned. These photos are shown to give the audience an image of the austerity of the conditions that the surgeon must face, yet still provide good surgical outcomes. Although the resources of facilities are quite limited, the problems presented to the surgeons who work here are not. On one single memorable day, I saw a patient trampled and gored by a bull, a local national police officer shot in the brain, a patient with a perforated appendicitis, and an infant with prune belly and a ureco cutaneous fistula. What do you do with that in a tent? Right. My answer was an exploratory ciliotomy with splenectomy, gastrotomy, closures, and fracture stabilization. Medical management for increased intracranial pressure and request for emergency air evacuation to the neurosurgical center of the nation. Peritoneal washout and open appendectomy and then a phone call home to speak to my colleagues who are a pediatric surgeon and a pediatric urologist to figure out where I could or if I even should start to try to address this child's problems. This may not be an average day while deployed or an average day in a rural U.S. hospital, but problems like these occur in both settings and we must be prepared to deal with them. These are photos of two small community hospitals that are geographically remote and contain limited resources. The picture on the left is of Weed Army Community Hospital and is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Uh, the one on the right where I was stationed as a new general surgeon is Keller Army Community Hospital and it's on the grounds of the United States Military Academy at West Point. Surgeons of small facilities like these must be aware at all times of the resources at his disposal and of the conditions that affect patient evacuation. As I hope to show later, our training conditions us to do just that. So how do we get our surgeons into our system to train them for these duty locations? Our surgeons come from several sources, but they can be classified into Army residents and fully trained surgeons. A resident pool comes from students who have been granted a military obligation from ROTC or West Point and have been granted a deferral from active service in order to go to medical school. There are also students who are directly commissioned after college who accept a medical school scholarship or those who participate in a loan repayment program but did not start with a scholarship. Both of those paths result in obligation to trade and serve in the U.S. Army after medical school is completed. The Uniformed Services University is the military's own medical school and represents the last pathway to Army surgery residency. Trained surgeons may sign up for loan repayment programs and may join directly without any monetary incentives, but both paths incur obligation to serve. The new fully trained surgeon receives general surgery training on being an, and excuse me, general training on being an officer and then specific education on deployment surgery 
both as an individual and as a member of a team and of a system. Listed on the right are some of these courses available. Just to make sure that it's clear to the audience, the cost of required training is borne by the Army, not the individual. After an initial basic course, a program uh, of study in our residencies gives the resident uh, training that continues their officer education and uh, provides them with a curriculum that is approved by both the RRC and the ABS, as well as specific curricula on war surgery at all levels of care and deployed surgery in environments other than war, such as humanitarian and disaster relief. I'll now expand more on what we do for resident training as this is most related to the development of a rural surgery training track for our civilian residents. At Tripler, my medical center, our curricula are vertically integrated throughout the residency so that there's not just a course or a rotation or a block of time that the resident is exposed to training for rural or remote care, but rather it is ubiquitous throughout the entire residency training program. As one can easily imagine, teaching for surgery for a practice in the remote medical activity or the forward surgical team is quite different than teaching surgery for practice in the major medical center such as Tripler. Nevertheless, our programs are responsible to prepare each graduate for service from the community hospital to the large medical center and for all levels in the field. We don't get to pick a site to train them for. We have to prepare them for all those levels and immediately. I have just recently sent a graduate to the war the day, last day of his residency. There is no time for charm school after. They need to be ready to go. One of the ways in which we prepare our, our surgeons is to have parallel curricula. This is most clearly demonstrated by our trauma and war surgery curricula. For trauma surgery, we teach the same trauma information found in uh, civilian programs, but we also teach war surgery from both our individual war experiences and from evidence-based sources like the Joint Trauma System Guidelines. These guidelines are housed and maintained by the Army's Institute of Surgical Research and gathered by the Joint Trauma Theater Registry as well as individual surgeons who record, interpret, and publish their own experiences, some at forum just like these. These are available for, pub for public viewing at the website listed on the slide and can be found by a simple internet search of the ISR and JTS guidelines. On their main guideline page, they have a link posted to email the webmaster with an imposing view to any published guidelines. And <clears throat> this process of constant assessment and improvement helps provide our programs and our trainees with current usable material that is specific to situations that they will encounter downrange and specifically that are different than you would find in a civilian training program. Additionally, we teach common procedures from surgical subspecialties and have either specific rotations or direct education from the subspecialty experts by didactic instruction, simulation, or clinical methods. Examples are cesarean section and lateral canthotomy with cantholysis. Simulation is particularly helpful for techniques like external fixation of fractures or craniectomy with a bitten brace and a giggly saw. So how do we get our surgeons, once they're trained, stationed to the rural or remote locations? This is where our system is less likely to be applied to the civilian community. Assignments are based on the needs of the Army, the needs of the individual, the individual skill set, rank, and previous assignments. All parameters factor into the eventual assignments, but the single most important factor is the need of the Army. So a surgeon who wants to become more competitive for, say, selection eventually into a fully funded training in colorectal surgery, might volunteer for a more remote posting after he completes his surgical residency. Ultimately, there is a distribution of surgeons across the globe with variable tour lengths based on one's desires and one's location. So once a surgeon is assigned, how do we support and sustain them in these rural locations? Some of the ways are listed here. We've discussed regionalization of care, but I'd like to again emphasize that our system is not just a set of willing surgeons re ready to take the rural surgeon's complex patients, but rather regionalization of support for the surgeon as well. Our system supports our surgeons with global medical information support by using an instantaneous worldwide outpatient electronic medical record, as well as digital medical imaging and capture and evaluation systems. We heard a lot earlier on about people bemoaning going to electronic medical record. I tell you as a physician champion for some of our systems, embrace it, turn into the skid, and eventually you're going to try to wonder how you ever worked without it. <clears throat> our system supports uh, uh, 
uh, system, excuse me, provides the, the surgeon capability to see notes written anywhere in the world immediately upon completion. The reciprocal is true for surgical consultants, as they can see the notes written by referring providers and thus make their consultations, whether in person or via remote systems, more efficient and effective. As I pointed out earlier in the case of the infant in Central America, the ability to directly call a willing and helpful colleague from a deployed location or rural type setting is an invaluable resource. As a consultant, I have never turned down a call, nor have I ever had one of mine as a, to a consultant be not immediately answered and be helpful. The image to the right of the screen is a screenshot from our outpatient electronic medical record. We heard earlier today people talking about difficulties with medical records or electronic systems not talking. We have that too and we try to solve that. This is, um, in our region, our informatics team has worked with the VA to create a link that, that puts the medical records of both together by clicking on that one byte, that one slide right there. What happens is the medical record opens up and you can see the VA side of the house. You can see their records for the patient that you're caring for in your clinic. This nexus increases, increases the ability of the rural surgeon to quickly and safely care for his patient. Next, I'll show you some systems designed to assist the surgeon with expert advice and be able to keep his patients locally when it is within his capability and the capability of his facility to do so. These are screenshots from Tripler's Pacific Asynchronous Telehealth or PATH system. Providers and consultants are given accounts and a secure portal is created that links patient data, notes, images, and chat streams. This enhances communication across all pertinent disciplines in a, and all locations in an asynchronous manner. The referring provider can use this portal to get advice or to request a patient transfer for consultation or definitive care. The system is a module for adults and a module for children. The screenshot has been redacted for patient privacy. The consulting surgeon can use this system to track the status of his patients with regards to both their location and their progress through the consultation process or services requested. It serves to augment communication for care upon the patient's return to home, as well as coordination of the patient's physical travel. The system supports the education of the surgeon also with aloha. Now aloha has several meanings in Hawaiian. It's hello, goodbye, and I love you. But in my hospital, it also means the asynchronous local overseas hospital academic system. As you can tell, the Army loves acronyms. I'll address the system in a bit, but I just wanted to point this out to you during the system as I have the screen up now. So I believe we have some pretty robust systems to help support the rural surgeons with their non-urgent cases. So how do we support them locally with their more acute or critical patients? Our answer is the EICU. Our electronic ICU is an, is an adaptation of off-the-shelf technology and secure communication systems that link the consulting hospital to our critical care physicians. Direct links with the medical records, monitors, in-room cameras, and two-way voice communication allow for multidisciplinary medical care where and when a surgeon needs it, especially for patients that the surgeon may not be able to transfer. This resource is well appreciated by the community hospitals of our surgeon, uh, excuse me, and surgeons in our region. Over the years, we have developed other tools to support providers throughout our region. These include the Aloha system mentioned earlier and real-time video teleconference tumor boards, grand rounds, and genetic counseling. The Aloha system records and archives academic presentations and allows providers to review these files at their convenience. We're working on internal systems to provide and track CMEs as well. Currently, the six specialties listed on the slide participate in the program and we're working on funding to provide more. The video, conference, video teleconference tumor board is called when a facility wants to present a case and have an interactive presentation and discussion with the pertinent medical, radiological, surgical oncologist, as well as subspecialty radiologists. The video teleconference grand rounds are self-explanatory, but is you being used less as the ALOHA system builds up. And this is a practical matter just due to the difficulty of coordinating conferences across 15 time zones. My hereditary colorectal cancer clinic supports the video teleconference genetic counseling and it can assist the rural surgeons and their patients with cutting edge genetic evaluations, genetic testing and interventions for colorectal cancer, as well as a host of other genetic based diseases. It also serves as another way to get an opinion from a limited array of subspecialists. So in summary, Army surgery is a worldwide system. It is a system of care and support for the patients as well as a system of education and support for the surgeons at all levels and across the globe. 
By being responsible for the surgeons and the patients, our system works to optimize the best way to care for all of us stakeholders at all levels. Regionalization of rural surgery in the United States along the lines of trauma regionalization may benefit both patients and rural surgeons as long as it is regionalization of support in conjunction with uh, regionalization of evacuation of patients. Recruitment policies that involve incentivizing surgeons to rural surgery and create a rural surgery obligation, especially for young surgeons, may help with increasing and maintaining appropriate steady state numbers for rural surgeons. Robust training in the diseases and procedures expected in the rural environment is critical to success in rural surgery and it ideally should be vertically in, uh, integrated throughout the residency training. My belief is that rural surgery is not just a course or a rotation, but a constant mindset. The Army's duty assignment process is unlikely to be copied in the civilian sector and I'm unable to make any recommendations as to how this may be implemented in the civilian sector without perhaps establishing some type of public surgery corps, perhaps under the auspices of the public health service or on a state by state basis. I believe supporting and sustaining the rural and remote surgeons is imperative to their long term viability and to the viability of the field of rural surgery. An effort should be made to help the rural surgeons keep their patients locally and still provide great care. I'd like to thank the American College of Surgeons Advisory Council on Rural Surgery and the Southwestern Surgical Conference for the privilege of speaking here today. Thank you for your attention.